Erev Tov, everyone. Now, as it is summer, we have a lot of daylight hours, so it's good that we're starting this class early while it's still light outside, because the nighttime can be a very scary time. Uh, unfortunately, the reality is a lot of crimes take place at night, but even not real things, things like shadows, things that go bump in the night, the animals that are living in our walls, I'm not kidding about that, that keep Sarah up half the night, they're very scary things that decide to come out at night. But on the other hand, night is also a time of calm when the city quiets down, when there aren't as many blaring noises and lights, it's a time for reflection, especially if you're in a safe, quiet place or a door county or something like that. So there are different sides tonight. It's a time of fear, but it's also a time of calm and contemplation. And what's really interesting is we can see this idea reflected very much in our classical Jewish sources about how our tradition views night. Because you might think particularly in ancient times, when before, you know, they certainly had candles in the times of the Talmud, um, and, and in the Torah we had fire, but before the invention of electricity, nighttime was very dangerous. So you would think that it, the perspective of all ancient cultures would be never leave your house at night. And in fact, Friday night, the uh, evening service, Ma'ariv, is shorter than it is during the rest of the week. And the reason for that, or sorry, the opposite, it's longer than it is during the rest of the week. There's an extra component of it so that if somebody is coming late to synagogue and they do the usual quick service and everybody leaves, they would go home alone. But on Friday night, in case somebody comes late, there's an extra part of the service, a repetition. There's usually never a repetition of the Amidah during the week for Ma'ariv. There is on Shabbat. So the latecomers can catch up and walk home with everybody so they don't have to walk home on the dark night. Because even in summer when there's extra light, Friday night services, Kabbalah Shabbat, always start late. So no one should ever walk home in darkness. So we see that idea reflected in Jewish law. But the question is, is there anything good about nighttime? So what we're going to do in this class, and the reason for it, as I've called it, Shavuot, the power and danger of night, is there's a custom, a fairly recent one from the 16th century, of staying up all night on Shavuot night, Shavuot night to learn Torah. Well, how can that be appropriate if night is a dangerous time? So we're going to look at uh, three different sections or three or four different sections that explore different rabbinic views of night, both that perhaps it's a good time, uh, some that it's not a good time, and does that have any influence on practical Jewish law about how we should or shouldn't be using the night, learning Torah, et cetera, like that. So without further ado, Ed, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And these first sources, this first section is kind of a, a survey. Uh, the sources don't necessarily build so much, but they just kind of take the point and say it in really interesting ways. And I really wanted to drive the point home. And it just, I thought all these sources were truly beautiful. So the first one is a midrashic source on the book Song of Songs, Shir Hashirim. So go ahead and source number one, please. Rabbi Yochanan stated. Sure. Rabbi Yochanan stated, there is no substance to Torah except at night. How do we know? For it says, she arises while it is still night, and get up, sing out at night. Rish Lakish Kish said, uh, day and night, as it says, you shall delve in it day and night. Resh Lakish said, what a great thing I heard from Rabbi Yohanan that there was no substance except at night. Resh Lakish said, since I studied Torah all day, at night it becomes clear to me. Thus, it says, you shall delve in it day and night. Excellent. So you see all of these ideas about night being an excellent time for Torah, and they bring in different verses. Now, this is, again, a midrashic source. This is not a legal source. This is not a commandment. However, there is a commandment to study Torah. And the understanding is that commandment is always active. But what they're saying here is that if you're going to, you know, if it's really all the time, then night should be just as good as the day. Although here, they're saying night is particularly special. And the last uh, uh, here from Reish Lakish, who was basically in, they translate as the Exilarch, but basically he was the head of the Jewish community, the political head of the Jewish community um, during his days. And what he said is the reason nighttime is so good is the whole day, there's so much craziness going on. You're learning Torah, but you have so many different things. And by the end of the day, things start to um, converge. Ideas become simple and clear again in the calm of night. So he is kind of giving a practical explanation after a long, intense day of studying, you kind of slow down, you're calmer, you're a little bit tired, and you kind of reflect on the day. So that's this midrashic idea. But again, 
you'll see a lot of these sources bringing in different verses that happen to have the word night in them that may have nothing to do with whether or not night is safe or not. But this idea over and over again that nighttime is not just good for Torah, it's the only time for Torah. So Jane, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you in source number two. And what's interesting is uh, we're going to jump around chronologically, but here we're in Rambam, Maimonides' Mishnah Torah, and this actually is in his section on the laws of Torah. And it's after a source where he said um, every Jew is commanded to learn Torah all day, day and night. However, he adds this, please, Jane. Although it is mandatory to study by day and by night, a man acquires most of his wisdom during nighttime. Therefore, whosoever desires to attain the crown of the Torah should take care of all of his nights, not to spend even one of them in sleeping, eating, drinking, conversation, or in like matters, but in study of the Torah and in matters of wisdom. Excellent. I'm going to step back for a moment and make two notes that perhaps some of you are wondering about. Is Rambam literally means stay up 24-7? No, he clearly doesn't. But the question is, when he says night, what does he mean? From the time when it starts to get dark, which could, you know, is sunset, which could be 5 p.m., the day's barely over until, you know, 10, 11 midnight or something like that. So just when it's dark outside, learn a little by candle before you go to sleep, maybe. Does he mean sometimes you should stay up all night? The reality is that in all of these sources, we're not 100% sure. There are a lot of legal sources that delineate the different parts of the night, sunset to midnight, midnight to the, you know, et cetera, like that. But these sources don't really make much of a distinction when they say learning at night. Now, one other thing, a fascinating podcast that I'm not going to, I don't remember the name, so I won't quote it, but it talked about our idea of night and sleeping is very out of whack these days because of electricity. Oftentimes in ancient cultures, when would people go to sleep? When it was dark outside. It was dark, they'd go to sleep. And this is a really interesting thing. They would often, this is true, we sleep in cycles. I think it's something like three hour cycles and our body goes from light sleep to medium sleep to deep sleep where we don't dream. And then we go out of that and we repeat these cycles. And a product of that, and again, I'm not making a claim that I'm a perfect scientist on this, but a product of that is we often wake up and somebody who's on a regular sleep cycle, whether or not they have to go to the bathroom, it's very normal to wake up once in the middle of the night. We usually don't remember it, but in ancient cultures, you actually had act often had people who'd wake up in the middle of the night. And what would you do if you had candlelight? You could study or you could go to the bathroom, whatever you want to do. But the way that people treated night in ancient times is different. Today, we stay up till 2 a.m. playing on our phones and then crash and get woken up by our kids, you know, crying at 4 a.m. But in ancient cultures, their concept of night was different. So as we're reading these sources, keep in mind that when it says night for them, it may not be our understanding of night. The experientially, the best way to uh, connect to it is probably the couple hours before bed. Before you go to sleep, don't just sit around wasting your time, learn Torah. That's probably the best way to apply it to today. Um, the next couple of sources here from the Talmud, and Elizabeth, I will go ahead and unmute you and let you take two sources because they're quite short. Uh, source number three, um, and again, a lot of these sources are quoted in all the conversations about studying Torah at night. Like they always, these are the, the highlights, the, you know, the top 20 hits. So go ahead, um, please, um, Elizabeth, source number three. Reish Lakish said, whoever occupies himself with Torah at night, the Holy One, blessed be he, extends a thread of kindness over him by day. As it is stated, by day, the Lord will command his kindness. And what is the reason that by day, the Lord will command his kindness? Because, and in the night, his song, i.e. the song of the Torah, is with me. Excellent. So again, here it's bringing different verses to kind of back up this idea. And again, a question that may pop in your heads is like, all right, Rabbi, clearly the rabbis of the Talmud think that night is very, very special, but why? And there doesn't seem to be a clear reason for it. And I'll actually, we'll look at some of the sources later. And again, I'll point out, there's no exact reason given. The rabbis don't say, by the way, night is good because of X. They make the statements, but we're left to fill in the blanks. And some of you, as maybe we'll take a pause, at, or we will take a pause, and some of you can guess maybe why you think, um, based on what you've read, the rabbis are so keen on learning at night. I might mention a few of their hypotheses, but again, the reason I'm not sharing a, here's why night is great, is because there doesn't seem to be, there's reasons given post facto by later commentaries that are beautiful uh, and midrashic in nature, but we're not 100% sure why this nighttime learning Torah, other than rabbis just said you should always be learning Torah. Uh, so the next source here, source number four, Elizabeth, from Ta'anit, please. 
From the 15th of Av onward, when the days begin to shorten, one who adds to his nightly Torah study will add years to his life, and he who does not add will be gathered. The Gemara says, what is the meaning of the phrase, he will be gathered? Rav Yosef said, it means that his mother will bury him as he will be gathered to his grave. So that's a little play on words. The word mosif means to add, and Yosef is one who is gathered together, i.e. one who dies. But the, re the way the, they're, they're understanding this first from Breshit is that somebody who doesn't learn a lot of Torah, they won't live a long life. But the opposite is somebody who learns Torah all day long will live a long life. And what's, uh, what's beautiful about this, um, the sources, or not beautiful about the source, what's interesting about the source is basically when the days are shorter and it becomes dark at 4.30 p.m., the rabbi saying, don't think, well, it's dark, I don't have to learn Torah anymore. If somebody should, has a candle, they should go out of their way to learn Torah. So this one makes sense. If someone says, I'm only going to learn Torah if the sun is in the sky, well, then half the year, you're going to learn half as much Torah. So this, this source might make a little more sense in response to a culture of going to sleep early uh, in the winter months and pushing back against that. Um, and then, you know what, uh, Elizabeth, why don't you take this last source because it's crazy, crazy short. Um, source number five, please. Rab, Rav Yehuda said, night was created only for sleep. Rabbi Shimon ben Lakish said, the moon was created only for Torah study by its light. Again, these, these statements are just kind of like beautiful, poetic and everything like that, but they reflect a love of Torah study. But like literally nighttime, the moon was only put up at night so you could learn Torah at night. So reading this section, you would think that nighttime is the best time of day. You should go out dancing on the town, learning Torah and everything like that. So before we go on and see a slightly different opinion on that, any questions up until now? Beautiful. So these may not beg questions as much, but the next section here is, ah, sorry, before we get on to the one that um, uh, I was talking about, uh, another section here, this practice of learning Torah all night on Shavuot. Now I said it only started really in the 16th century, um, but the idea of learning Torah at night that built up to it can be represented in these two sources. So Susan, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. So this source here is from the Zohar. Now this just talks about um, learning at night. So again, by the 13th century or whenever this book was written, um, that idea of learning late at night was obviously a beautiful and accepted idea. So go ahead, Susan, um, from the Zohar on uh, Parshat Emor. When the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai, they did the do, then did the do descend in fullness and they became purified and their filth departed from them and they joined with the king and Knesset Israel and they received the Torah. We have an established tradition that at that moment, all the rivers flow to the sea, Kohelet, in order to become purified and bathed, all joined and united with the holy king. For, and for this reason, the Hasidim Rishonim, the early pious people, would not sleep on this night. Rather, they would toil in Torah study and say, let us come and inherit the holy inheritance for us, for our descendants in both worlds. And that night, Knesset Yisrael became crowned upon them, and she comes to unite. She becomes crowned upon them, and she, become, she comes to unite with the king, and both of them become crowned upon the heads of those who merit it. Excellent. By the way, when you, we read Rambam in the Mishnah Torah, that idea of learning Torah at night and, and getting the crown of Torah, that idea is clearly an image here. But the importance of this source, a couple things, is regardless of how old it was, the idea of staying up all night on Shavuot, which is historically when we received the Torah, um, is an older one. It didn't become crazy popular. It didn't become this formal service of Tikkun Leil Shavuot, which will uh, understand in a second until later historically. But the idea that on Shavuot, when going back, you know, the Talmud said, that's when we received the Torah. And that night when we're waiting, anticipating till the next morning when we get the Torah, we should stay up all night preparing for it. So that idea is fairly old. Now the Mishnah Brura in the 20th century in Poland does an excellent summary for the Midrashic reason given by the 16th century Sfat Kabbalist for Tikkun Leil Shavuot and why it's called Tikkun, which is a kind of uh, repairing or improving on the night of Shavuot. So let's see, we got up to Tamar. If you would please take source number two um, from Rabbi Yisrael Meir HaKohen's Mishnah Berurah, which is the preeminent commentary on the Shulchan Aruch, or the first section of it. Mishnah Berurah from Chafetz Chaim. 
uh, it comes to us from the Zohar that the pious ones used to stay awake all night and concern themselves with Torah. It is already the custom of many students to do this, stay up all night and learn. The reason for this minhag is given by the Magen Abraham, who writes based on the Midrash that because Israel slept all night, the night of the receiving of the Torah at Har Sinai, Hashem needed to awaken them in order to receive the Torah. Therefore, now we need to stay up all night on Shavuot as a tikkun, a means of repairing the spiritual shortcomings of our ancestors. So we have two ideas here. Nighttime is a beautiful, auspicious, wonderful time to learn Torah. Then you have this Midrash that says on the, and again, it's Midrashic, but the evening before receiving the Torah, the Israelites fell asleep. And Moshe needed to, with Hashem's help, everybody wake up. You don't want to be asleep when the Torah is coming in the morning. It's such a wonderful thing. Now, because we lazily almost slept, like sleeping through your alarm and missing work, we almost missed Hashem giving us the entire Torah. So to make up for that, we stay up all night learning Torah. But again, nighttime is the best time for learning Torah. So you have a, a combination of those two beautiful ideas. And if we ended here, you would A, both know at least the given reasons for why we have Tikkun Leil Shavuot. This is the understanding for it. I've told you the historical moment. It was developed by the Kabbalist of Tzfat. Um, and the Kabbalist also, you know, uh, really dug into that idea that Torah or nighttime was a special time to learn Torah. So if we ended here, we'd say that's great. I should stay up late learning Torah. Shavuot is like the ideal example, the, the apotheosis of learning Torah at night. But we're not going to end there because I never want to end there. So the next section here is going to take actually a pause away from the idea of learning Torah and show you that nighttime is not all good. And we'll talk about why this next source goes in a very di different direction of night, because if you look at a lot of ancient cultures or people who live in dangerous urban neighborhoods, you don't go out at night. Now, the reasons people don't go out to, at night in 2023 are different than the reasons they wouldn't go out in, you know, 1000 BCE. So Gloria, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And this source from uh, Talmud Bavli Psachim not only discusses the danger of night, but has a really cool, wild midrashic story that explains why night even became as dangerous as it did. So please go ahead, Gloria, with regard to the instruction. With regard to the instruction, do not go out alone at night. The Gemara states that this is as it was taught in a Baraita. One should not go out alone at night neither on Tuesday nights nor on Shabbat nights, that is Friday nights, because the demon Agrat, daughter of Machalat, she and 180,000 angels of destruction go out at these times. And as each and every one of them has permission to destroy by itself, they are all the more dangerous when they go forth together. The Gemara states, Initially, these demons were present every day. One Sagrat, daughter of Maharlat, met Rabbi Hanina Bendosa and said to him, had they not announced about you in the heavens, be careful of Hanina and his Torah. I would have placed you in danger. He said to her, if I am considered important in heaven, I decree upon you that you should never travel through inhabited places. She said to him, I beg you, leave me a little space. He left for her Shabbat nights and Tuesday nights. Excellent, thank you. So this is hyper-specific. So if you go out on a Wednesday night alone in the dark, you should be fine. But remember what I said about Friday night services, Ma'ariv has an, uh, a repetition, which it never has during the week to allow latecomers to be able to walk home with everyone. Now, is that because of actual dangers, because of demons? And there are many other sources that talk about the dangers at night. Now, the language of the Talmud for the dangers at night, sometimes they do talk about listim, you know, bandits, et cetera, like that, but they often talk about demons. But they also talk about not even going out alone anytime. You really should go with, you know, at least two or three other people. And even going in a pair might be dangerous. So there's a lot of spiritual, um, uh, mystical reasons that things are dangerous. But ultimately, nighttime, if you're going out of your house, can be very dangerous. But in response to that, 
where do we learn Torah? We usually don't learn it when we're walking through the alleyways. We usually learn it uh, at home alone. So the answer in response to this is nighttime is not always safe. There are a lot of dangers at night. And the rabbis talk about when somebody sleeps. There's a Talmudic teaching, an ancient Jewish teaching that our souls leave our bodies and then our physical bodies are at risk of being attacked by demons. Um, and it's almost like we've died a little bit. So nighttime has a lot of danger in it. But if you're sitting safely in your home learning Torah, then you're, you're totally fine. But again, if we were to stop here, then we would say, as long as you're home safe, learning Torah, you're great. Just don't go out alone at night and probably just don't leave your house uh, at all at night. Certainly, you know, not alone. But again, we'd leave with fine, but you can stay home and learn Torah at night. So when I said, um, uh, yeah, when I said uh, Torah is uh, okay at night, or I said, yeah, when night is dangerous, that's only if you go out of your house. But if you stay in a safe place, you're good to go. So again, we could end there, but as I said, I don't like ending there. So we're going to go all the way back around to, oh, did we lose somebody? Oh, Ed, you're there. Okay, Ed, I'm going to unmute you. And one of the questions was, given all of this, nighttime being dangerous, did people actually learn Torah at night? Was nighttime, you know, the rabbis, did they put their money where their mouth is? And this source actually talks about, the section is when to say the Shema, the evening prayer. And there's actually an extra one that said very, very late. And the way this describes it and how people would use the night is very relevant to our case here. So go ahead, Ed, please, uh, source number one, the Gemara answers. The Gemara answers, actually, the rabbis hold in accordance with the opinion of Rabban Gamliel, and the fact that they say until midnight is in order to distance a person from transgression. As it was, as it was taught in a baraita, the rabbis created a fence for their pronouncements with regard to the recitation of Shema in order to prevent a situation where a person comes home from a field in the evening, tired from his day's work, and knowing that he is permitted to recite Shema until dawn, says to himself, I will go home, eat a little, drink a little, sleep a little, and then I will recite Shema and recite the evening prayer. In the meantime, he is overcome by sleep and ends up sleeping all night. However, since one is concerned lest he fall asleep and fail to wake up before midnight in order to recite Shema at the appropriate time, he will come from the field in the evening, enter the synagogue, and until it is time to pray, he will immer immerse himself in Torah. If he is accustomed to reading the Bible, he reads. If he is accustomed to learning Mishnayat, a more advanced level of study, he learns, and then he recites Shema and prays as he should. When he arrives home, he eats his meal with a contented heart and recites a blessing. Excellent. So you might even say that perhaps the source can explain everything else the rabbis are doing. Why are they pushing for nighttime Torah study? So when people get home from work and they're exhausted and they're waiting to the evening prayer, they don't sleep through it. They learn a little bit of Torah, wait until they finished all the day's prayers, and then they go to sleep. Maybe that's a practical reason for it, but we know here that the rabbis are ruling that learning Torah at night is not just a good thing. It's They don't say it's required, but they really push for somebody to do that. You really should learn Torah. You should read the five books of Moshe, the Chumash, or maybe more advanced stuff, but there's no question the rabbis want you to learn Torah at night. That is until the 16th century, and that's when things get a little bit weird. And they, the, the weirdness starts with a midrash. So when it describes Moshe going up on Harsinai, you know, he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. So Elizabeth, I'm going to go ahead and mute you. So this uh, midrash, which we don't know exactly when it was compiled, sometime between the 2nd to 8th century, talks about a midrash about Moshe learning Torah up at Harsinai. So go ahead, please, Elizabeth. All 40 days that Moshe stood at the mountain, he learned scripture by day and repeated, studied the oral tradition by night. Excellent. So I'm going to point out a translation here that'll be really important for the next sources. So it says here that the 40 days he was up there, he did mikra. Now the word mikra from the word kore to read refers to the written text of the Torah, the five books of Moshe, Humash, you know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you know, Breshit, etc. So that's what he learned during the day. But when the nighttime came, that's when God, uh, Hashem, gave Moshe the oral tradition, the Mishnah and all of the you know, rabbinic laws. So daytime is for the scripture, the written text, and nighttime is for the oral tradition. Okay, fine, nothing special. And again, the latest this Midrash came on the scene was the 8th century. 
But now we jump ahead to the 16th century, and this is where things get murky. And I couldn't really find something that answered my, you know, what's going on here. There seems to be some sort of uh, uh, um, debate going on here, some inconsistency. So in the 16th century, when the idea of staying up all night to learn on Shavuot was getting popularity from the Kabbalists, perhaps the most famous Kabbalist of all, Isaac Luria, Yitzchak Luria, known as the Arizal, um, uh, was quoted by his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital, as having said the following. And Jane, if you could, where'd you go? The, the things keep jumping around. Okay, Jane, if you want to unmute yourself, this is, again, it's from the words of Isaac Luria, one of the greatest mystics, Kabbalists ever from Tzfat, but it's said, it's written by his student, Rabbi Chaim Vital. So go ahead, please, Jane. On Thursday night, one would read 26 verses from the Parsha itself. But on the other nights of the week, it is not appropriate to read scripture as the scripture is part of our created world, an aspect of Dean judgment. And night itself is also part of our made judged world. And all this is an aspect of judgment, Dinin. And it is not appropriate to awaken the power of judgment. But on Thursday night, it's okay because one is preparing for Shabbat and the aspect of mercy is awakened in one's actions. Therefore, it is appropriate to study scripture at night. Excellent. So we'll take a step back from it because there's a lot of Kabbalistic concepts here, but let's think about the idea of a person. Sometimes I, I use this example with someone today. The other night I was very stressed and my daughter was asking for dessert. Because I was in a stressed mood, I said no. But if I was in a relaxed mood, I probably would have said yes. Now I am a human being, I'm complex, and you know, I can it's hard to hold multiple emotions at once, but God is in perfect, perfect balance. However, there are times when God chooses to act in a more strict measure, i.e. when somebody is you know, sinning, and God will use judgment, the aspect of deen and harshness. And again, it's not punishment for punishment's sake, but someone gets the appropriate consequences. But then the holiest day of the year is the exact opposite of that. Yom Kippur is when God uses God's mercy, God's rachamim. God, again, can choose to do whatever God wants, but on Yom Kippur, God is in a forgiving mood. Again, we say that God doesn't really have moods, but, uh, but sometimes God will be strict with us. Sometimes God will be really nice with us. And this is where things get a little bit weird. The Kabbalists talk about four different worlds. There's the abstract world, like basically God thinking, oh, I should create a universe. And you go down through all the four worlds until you get to this world. Again, some quantum physicists could probably make some sort of allegory to it. But basically, we live in the world that exists, that's real, that's harsh. Things are hard. Things exist. The Torah represents that world of ruling. This is how things are. And if somebody eats unkosher food or breaks Shabbat, technically the way things are is they should be punished. So just like this world exists, it's hard and physical, so too if someone sins, they should have a punishment. That's the world of judgment. And at nighttime, if somebody's learning Torah, they're basically asking for God to come down and being extra judgy on them, as it were. They're really present in this world. And they're saying, God, I want you to judge me. I want to have the consequences for it. And the Arizal says, nighttime is not a good time to learn basically the mitzvot and the harsh Torah decrees, et cetera, like that, because you're basically asking God to be strict with you. So don't do it at night, except for Thursday night, because then you're reading Torah to prepare for reading it on Shabbat. That's the exception of the rule. But nighttime has this aspect of judgment. But what's interesting, we haven't seen this before. We haven't seen this idea. Nighttime is the best time to learn Torah. And now he's coming along and saying nighttime is not the best time to learn, and he makes a distinction. Scripture, the written, the written Torah, the five books of Moshe, we don't learn that at night with the exception of Torah. So even if some of those ideas are over your head, the takeaway from this is that in the 16th century, all of a sudden there's this new idea, we don't learn Torah at night, whereas we literally just saw in the Talmud, you should learn Torah at night, specifically the five books of Moshe, the Mikra, the written scripture. We don't really know what things change. We don't know historically where this is coming from. And again, maybe there's an explanation out there that's hit it right on the head, but I haven't seen it. But now that this Kabbalistic idea is out in the world, does everything change? How can we have? The Kabbalists came up with the idea of learning Torah all night. Their greatest teacher said, don't learn Torah at night. So what do we do? Is it practically actually done? So in practice, and this is really cool, the Shulchan Aruch, written by Rav Yosef Cairo, was writing in Sfat in the 16th century or the 17th century, right after Arizal. 
So he absolutely was familiar with his work. It's possible they actually met each other, but he definitely directly was in conversation uh, with his works. So he is very much a student and a Kabbalist himself. So what does he say about the night? So Jane, if you want to take it just because it's so short and you're already sure. on YouTube. One needs to be careful to study at night more than during the day. And one who does not do this will be punished greatly. So it's the exact opposite of Arizal. Not only may you study at night, you actually should study at night. So he's reflective of all of those Talmudic sources. Nighttime is the best to do it. And you need to actually pay more attention at night, maybe because you're tired or maybe because what did all the Talmudic sources say? If you study Torah at night, you'll live a long life. It's the best time for study. So in practical, you know, in practice, in law, nighttime is the time to study. But he doesn't mention that there is this kind of debate, there's this kind of machloket between the two sources. So to resolve that, you need to go back to Rabbi Yisrael Merah Kohen, who wrote the Mishnah Brura, and in the bottom of his page, he has another commentary called the Shara Tzion. And here's where he put things that he's like, they're important, but they're not that important. They're tangentially connected. If I have space on the page, I'll include a thing or two. And he says, oh yeah, the Arizal said you shouldn't learn Torah at night. So I'll just respond to that. So I'll take this last one. It says, it's written in the name of the Be'er Heteb, which is a commentary in the Shulchan Aruch, 18th century, that we do not read scripture at night, specifically the written Torah. But it's brought from the words of the Prima Gadim, eight, also 18th century, that one is able to read scripture at night. So what is it? Are we allowed to? And it appears that even for the ones who are strict about this, um, don't treat it as an actual prohibition, meaning the people who say, I'm going to hold by Isaac Luria, the Arizal, and not study Torah at night, but I'm never going to say that's prohibited. It's just my custom to not learn Torah at night. So he concludes, rather that ideally, it's better to learn scripture during the day. So for all intents and purposes, nobody says it's forbidden at night. If Is there a slight preference among the mystical minded to not learn written scripture at night? Yeah, there is. Does anybody hold by it? You'd have to go to the Kabbalah Center in LA because they're definitely the highest level of, of Mekubalim there of Kabbalists and ask them. But practically speaking, nobody really holds by that. And we see that's reflective of this long, strong tradition of nighttime being very special for Torah. But again, what's so interesting about this is we're not entirely certain why. Again, we can pontificate. It's about the calm of night. You don't have the distractions um, during the day. You're at home. There's nothing else going on. And maybe that. It, maybe it's that. Maybe that's the reason. It's as simple as that. And the rabbis wanted people to take advantage of that. But what's grown out of it in the Talmudic literature is it's not just a good psychological time. There's this, uh, this spiritual strength to it. The rabbis even, I didn't mention here, a source that talks about um, God, God being more awake or whatever it is at midnight, which changes depending on the time of the year and the hours of the day, and waking up at midnight and basically praying to God and wailing and weeping and reading verses of lamentations, it's called tikkun uh, leil chatzot, um, you know, uh, repairing the damage we did that led to the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash, and saying prayers and reading texts there because God is, you know, extra paying attention there. So nighttime is a very powerful time to learn Torah. So we see that come out in the strongest way in Shavuot, and many people do indeed have customs to wake up late at night. And again, does anyone hold by the Arizal and not learn scripture at night? I'm sure plenty of people do. But regardless of all of this, Lake Park Synagogue's custom is at night, we want to go to sleep, so we learn Torah during the day, and we do Tikkun Yom Shavuot. But when you're out at night, if you're out alone, find somebody to be with, run at home. But if you're sitting at your home at night, and you have an option, to open up your computer and watch Netflix, and I'm sure none of us have our own Netflix accounts, you're sharing your mother's password or something like that, close your computer, pick up a book of Torah, and learn a little bit. Because when the world actually stops, when you close computer and the world actually stops, there's no better time to be calm, focused, and connect to our Torah and connect to God. And I think the rabbis were understanding of that beauty, whether it's on Shavuot night or regular night of the week, there's something special and beautiful about night, and I think that's reflected here in these sources.